So there are some cute little questions that come up with vector calculus and the dot product. So I've just pulled three out of the textbook. I'm just going to run through them, sort of show you sort of the ideas behind them. Okay, uh, we'll start with question five. Uh, the position of a particle at time t is given by this. Prove that r dot t, so the velocity and the acceleration, are always perpendicular. Alright, so all we're going to do is find the velocity and find the acceleration. Now this video is not about doing that, so you should be able to do that very quickly by finding the derivative of this and then the derivative of that. Alright, so there is the velocity. Uh, I've just derived our original function. Uh, just be careful, tj is the derivative of t is 1, so tj, the derivative of tj is just 1j. Alright, uh, and then we need to find the derivative of that. All right, so pretty straightforward. Again, you need to be a little bit careful. The derivative of 1j is 0j. There's no real need to like write it up there. Um, it's not necessary, but it is going to be useful for me in this next bit. Okay, so this is a vector that changes over time, right? It's a velocity vector that changes depending on the value of the t. Um, this is a is an acceleration vector that changes with time. If we put in different t values, we're going to get different things. Now, what they're saying is that whatever, whatever direction this velocity vector is pointing in, the acceleration vector will always be pointing at a 90 degree angle. Always. Okay, And that does happen with some forms of motion. We're going to talk about that in future videos. Uh, now, how do we prove it? Well, perpendicular vectors, we should be thinking about the dot product. So, we can look at these in like a slightly different form. So, I can write this vector function just as a vector, just as a column vector, like cos t, um, 1 and negative sine t, like that. And, of course, I can write the acceleration function in exactly the same way. So negative sine t, 0 and cos t, but... Um, Negative. Okay, so if they are, if these two vectors are indeed always perpendicular, then the dot product will always be zero. And it doesn't matter what the value of t is, it'll just always be zero. So let's find the dot product of r dot t, that's a funny r, and r dot dot t. All right, so remember to find the dot product, you multiply the i components, the j components, and the k components. So we get cos t times negative sine t, so that's negative cos t sine t. We do 1 times 0, which is 0. And we do negative sine t times cos t, which is positive cos t sine t. And it felt like it was going to be really difficult because like there's a bunch of coses and sines and things, but negative cos t sine t plus cos t sine t they cancel each other out. Magically, it doesn't matter what the t value is, these two vectors will always be perpendicular to each other. The velocity of this particle and the acceleration of this particle will always be at right angles. That's the basic concept. Now, it is not always the case that a velocity vector and an acceleration vector would always be perpendicular. Uh, and so that's going to be what's going to happen in our next example which says, this is a different question, let's get rid of this. So this one says, find when the velocity and acceleration vectors are perpendicular. So I'm assuming, we'll find out, I'm assuming that most of the time in this one, the velocity vector and the acceleration vector are not at right angles. Maybe they're like this, or a bit like this, or a bit like this. But there seems to be at least one time when there are at right angles. All right, so first things first, let's find out what the velocity and the acceleration vectors are. I got halfway through doing it, and I realized it's probably easier if we manipulate the displacement vector first, just by expanding this 16 squared bracket 3 minus t. So I'm just going to rewrite the displacement vector first. All right, so the 2ti bit didn't need rewriting, but expanding the brackets for j to be 48t squared minus 16t cubed just makes it easier to derive. All right, so r dot t is going to be equal to the derivative of that, which is 2i, plus the derivative of that, which is 96t, 
minus the derivative of that, which is 48t squared. Boop, boop. All right, there is our velocity. And here is our acceleration. Um, so we've 2i, now the derivative of that is 0, so we've just got a 0i there. Uh, and then here we've got 96 minus 96tj. All right, so we have a velocity function, we have an acceleration function. Now remember, we want r dot this, the dot product of those two, to be equal to zero. All right, so let's do the dot product of those two. Again, easier if I write them as like columns. So we're going two and 96t minus 48t squared. That is our velocity function. And then we're gonna do the dot product of that with this one. So zero and then 96 minus 96t. All right, so doing the dot product of that is relatively straightforward because two times zero is zero. And so then what I'm left with is like something that feels pretty gross, actually. I end up with 96t um, bracket minus 48t squared bracket bracket 96 minus 96t equal to zero. It looks like what I have is like a cubic uh, that I need to solve. So not a big fan of that. What I am noticing is like I could take 48 out of, of here. And in fact, not only just take 48 out, but I could also take 48t out. And also what I'm noticing is I can take 96 out of here. All right, 96. And that gives me 1 minus t. Wow. Okay. Suddenly the question doesn't get to look so enormous because I can divide both sides by 48 to get rid of this and I can divide both sides by 96 because 0 divided by 96 is 0 to get this. So suddenly the question is not like this big enormous thing anymore. It's just 0 equals the t still there. I didn't cross that out. t times 2 minus t times 1 minus t. Oh, great. And now I can just null factor the law of that, right? Because if 0 is equal to this times this times this, then this must be 0, or this must be 0, or this must be 0. So therefore, t must be equal to 0, or 2 minus t must be equal to 0, which means uh, that t must be equal to 2. Or 1 minus t must be equal to 0, which means that uh, t must be equal to 1. So that's very cute. Um, it seems like these are perpendicular at time 0, time 1, and time 2. And I thought that was very strange. Um, they aren't. They aren't. Not all of those work. Only two of those work, arguably. So let's take a look at why one of them doesn't work. And the reason you'll find out that they, they don't work is when you do part B. Part A... You don't know that they don't work until you do part B. It's a sneaky, sneaky bit. So the, the next bit says the pairs of perpendicular vectors, this and this, right? So they're, what they're saying is, well, if they're perpendicular this time and this time and this time, what actually are the, what actually is the velocity and what actually is the acceleration at those times? Well, the velocity and the acceleration at time zero is easy, right? So we're just subbing zero into both of these. So if I sub 0 into here, I still get 2i. And that will always be the case if I sub 0 in there. Um, then if I sub 0 into here, I just get 0j. All right, so that is the velocity vector at time 0. The acceleration vector at time 0 is 0i plus, and then if I put 0 in here, I get 96 minus zero. So I get 96, 96j. Okay, so that's how you do it for time zero. Um, I'll do it for time two as well, just off camera so you can see it. Okay, very good. Um, so look look at these pairs of vectors, right? This one is two in the i direction. This one is 96 in the j direction, very clearly at right angles to each other. So yes, I agree. These ones here, 
This one is 2 in the i direction, nine, negative 96 in the j direction. So very clearly at right angles to each other. Watch what happens when we do R1. Because up until this point, I believed that because we've done our dot product and it says time 1, then they must be at right angles to each other. Uh, they're not. They're not. Watch, watch this. R dot, put 1 into 2i, we still get 2i. Put 1 into there, we get 48j. Here, let's put 1 into here. Putting 1 in for t there, we still just get 0i. Putting 1 in here, we get 96 minus 96 times 1. 96 minus 96, which is 0. Is 0i minus 0j a vector? I say no, right? It's got no length. It, it, an arrow, a, a vector needs a direction and, and magnitude. This, this, is, this is not a vector. So it's, even though it's spat out a dot product of 0, you would expect a dot product of 0 to come out if one of the vectors had 0i direction, 0j direction, and 0k direction, right? But is it meaningful to say that two vectors are perpendicular, which is what this dot product is telling me, or what, what this t equals 1 told me when I found the dot product was 0, if one of the vectors at that time does, doesn't exist? So this sort of leads us to like a nonsensical conclusion, right? Uh, very odd. Very odd. Okay, so... Um, this question's interesting because in part A it says find the times that they're perpendicular. The textbook gives two answers, 0 and 2, and they don't really give a great explanation for why 1 shouldn't be. It's not until you do part B that it becomes clear that 1 is not for this exact reason here. One of the vectors just doesn't exist at time 1. Um, now there is one more question. Uh, I think it's time to call it quits here, but I think this is a very interesting question. It's a similar kind of idea that what we're trying to do is look at um, vectors and positions and, and things, vectors, positions, that kind of thing, and use the dot product to solve things. Uh, but in this instance, we're not we're not dealing with a dot product of zero. We don't have things that are at right angles to each other. We're trying to find the time when you've got a 45 degree angle, which is very interesting tricky. If you want to talk about it, let me know. All right, there's some dot product ideas.